Now then, how are you doing? I hope you're well. On my recent travels in Scotland, I stumbled upon the Falls of Dockhart, which are located in a small village called Killin in Stirling. Well, following several days of relentless heavy rain, the falls were in full spate and really quite spectacular to behold. Well, naturally, with a future project already taking shape in my mind, I shot some video footage and took a few photos. I finally got around to painting it. The full project is available to those who are signed up to my online student service. Uh, it features a full-length painting demonstration, a step-by-step -step breakdown and a guide to painting it yourself with lots of extra stuff too. More information on how to access all that will be available later in the video and in the video description below. In the meantime, here are some excerpts from the demonstration with some tips on how to paint raging waters. This is the village of Killin, close to the city of Stirling in Scotland. And these are the Falls of Dockart, situated on the river Dockart near the western edge of Loch Tay. After drawing my scene out with a 2B pencil, my first job is to mix up a blue-grey colour from French Ultramarine and Burnt Umber. I recommend always starting with the French Ultramarine and adding Burnt Umber to it, not the other way round. If you're doing it right, the two colours should neutralise each other. As you can see, I'm using this colour to paint in the sky, graduating it by adding clean water as I go along. I'm also using it to paint in the rocks visible in the middle of the river. The white water is running along its bottom edge, however, so it's important to bear that in mind and not make that bottom edge too flat or straight, or it'll send out the wrong message. It wants to be wobbly with a few random breaks and splashes here and there. This seems as good a time as any to talk about foam patterns. These are the light patterns of foam that float around on the surface of the water. You can see that I'm creating spray at the bottom of the waterfall by painting around it negatively. I'm creating foam patterns in exactly the same way. The brush strokes create the spaces between the patterns, leaving the foam as white, untouched highlights. The reason they are significant is because they help to explain the contours of the water. There are a few things I need to watch out for though. Firstly, if the foam patterns are to look natural, then they must look as random as possible. Repetitive patterns do occur, but only fleetingly. Remember, the water is constantly moving, so whatever we paint represents only a very short moment in time. It mustn't look static though. Our aim should be to create a sense of movement. This is a big, wide river. To reinforce the grand scale of it all, it's important not to forget to render more distant elements. Here I'm painting in the more distant falls, which don't need quite so much detail, but they do provide much needed secondary visual information. In a scene like this, what you don't paint is as important and often more important than what you do paint. Less is more and all that. 
fast-running rivers often carry sediment, dredged up from the river floor and ripped from the riverbanks as it flows past. Well, this can help to give water what we call local colour. In a scene like this, the colour can be particularly prominent around the sections where the river is at its most turbulent. It's here that I'm going to apply some small amounts of raw sienna, blending it in as I go. If you're interested in this subject and want to explore it further, then I'm very happy to tell you that it is available as a full working project in my online student service. As well as being able to watch the full length painting demonstration, online students can also access a step-by-step -step breakdown and many resources on how to paint it themselves. As well as this project, there are many others to choose from, along with two courses on watercolour for beginners and pencil drawing. There are hundreds of video demonstrations available to view 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, and all available from a single subscription. A video only option is also available at a special reduced rate. So for full details on how to become an online student and enjoy one-to-one -one feedback and tuition from me in the comfort of your own home, simply visit my website at peterwoolley.co.uk. Select online students from the main menu. Now, back to the raging waters. I've now turned my attention back to the action in the foreground, and specifically the large rocks visible amongst the raging torrent. With a single tone and colour, the rocks have a tendency to look flat and two-dimensional. By adding a second tone, in this case I'm using French Ultramarine, it instantly changes that two-dimensional shape into a three-dimensional one. In other words, rocks have a top and sides. By adding a second, slightly darker wash, I've effectively added a second physical surface. It's also worth saying at this point that in watercolour, tone is relative. We don't paint light tones, we create light tones by placing dark tones next to them. In other words, the lighter and brighter we want the white water to appear, the darker the adjacent tone needs to be. It's for that reason that I'm deliberately darkening the rocks at the point where they meet the white spray of the water, hopefully increasing the impact of the water by doing so. Clearly, with the river as turbulent and chaotic as this, there isn't a lot of call for reflections. For that, you generally need much calmer water. Having said all that, there will be areas where the dark tones of the rocks are likely to be reflected in the water. And I'm specifically looking at the immediate foreground as I say this. Remember those foam holes? It's here that I'm going to apply a few selected dark tones, but mostly only where they align with the darker tones of the rocks, if that makes sense. The constant movement of the water will distort the reflections, of course, so I can drag them out and create interesting patterns with them. But what you'll notice I'm doing is softening them off almost every time to blend them into the surrounding wash. 
The plan is hopefully to use those dark patches to give extra impact and dynamics to the flow of the water. Fundamentally, this is the primary job of every brush mark in the river, to visually explain shape and movement. Painting white water is always a massive challenge. I hope that was helpful to you. Until next time, take care.